cloud. All right, good afternoon or good evening or good morning to everyone, depending on where you are located. Um, today is June, um, it is June 11th, 2020, and this is the Hamside Telecon. So we're gonna do a general uh, telecon today, uh, very similar to the way to the Tangerine SDR group goes. So I'll just go down the list and you can say, um, you know, who you are and give a couple uh, comments about um, what you have been doing uh, this week and, um, and what your, any updates that you wanna share with the group. And then after we go through the list, we will have a general discussion. So whoever would like to talk about something is free to do so. Um, one challenge with the Zoom is they seem to um, move the list around as people talk. So I, it's hard for me to just go straight down. So at the end, if I miss anyone, uh, let me know and we will have you jump in. So um, let's see. So that's pretty much it here. Uh, I'm Nathaniel, W2NAF. And my big work this week is I moved to a new QTH and we now have room for antennas. So, uh, <laughs> which is very good. And then of course, there's lots of work that's been going on at the personal space other stations. So um, over to you, Bob Gerzoff, um, WK2Y. Hello, can everyone hear me? Go ahead. Good. Um, I have been learning how to parse in R this week. Um, so that's my major goal, my major reason for undertaking some of this project is to get familiar with R. Um, learned a lot of stat languages, uh, but never had a chance to actually use R, so that's my goal. And I did just get back in from working um, portable by Lake Lanier for this morning. Uh, took the QRP rig out and uh, sat on a picnic bench and uh, worked a couple of stations QRP. That sounds good, Bob. It was right, very enjoyable. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be able to do that. <laughs> okay, uh, Dev, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we are working towards uh, getting getting to the point of uh, the software from UHA to analyze chop ionosund oblique uh, chop chop ionosund data for our personal space weather station. And we also have uh, the equipments uh, ordered. And I think next week or so, we'll receive them. After which we plan to install them here at, uh, in Scranton at Nathaniel's new house, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much. That sounds good. Um, let's see. Dave W, go ahead. Oh. Um. Hello. Uh, hey, Dave. I, I just got off a, another uh, a Google Meet, and I uh, hope I haven't missed anything. Uh, it took me a minute or two to find a link here. I uh, hope the time was right on the thing. Um, I mm -hmm. guess people are just saying what they've been up to. I've been writing code to use the magnetometer as a freestanding um, uh, tool for reading magnetic stuff and um, and I guess work with human some earlier. Um, other than that, not much. Thank you, Dave. Um, all right, next, Veronica. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, you can. Okay, um, well this week I have been working with Monster for Cell and learning how to write code to make graphs of data. Thank you very much, Veronica. And you've also been reading some papers too, right? About geomagnetic <laughs> storms and things like that. Yeah, a lot of reading. <laughs> it's pretty interesting yeah. though. Good, you've been working with Deb too on that. Thank you very much, Veronica. Okay, um, over to Aiden, uh, KB3UMD. All right, um, let's see. I have been helping um, Christina prepare for the solar eclipse that is happening in just two weeks, um, maybe a little less than that. And 
that we're having a trial run in just a day or so. So that is very exciting. And I, last night, um, played for the first time with recording data from Kiwi SDRs. So hopefully we can pull some of that data too. That sounds great, Amy. Um, okay, so I'll go to Christina next then, KD8OXT. Hey there, I've got this written, so I'll just uh, paste it into the window so you don't have to, Nathaniel. Um, so okay. I've been uh, working on um, a paper on our October experiment with Aiden, and I finally got myself in ham radio land a, uh, a nice satellite antenna, so I've been doing some satellite passes lately. I see John is cheering for me, which I appreciate. Um, but uh, yeah, main thing that is on our minds this week is um, the dry run for the uh, festival frequency measurement, which will be the first round of data collection for, uh, for that experiment, will begin in two days, four hours, 53 minutes and 48, 47, 46 seconds. So uh, we're going to do a dry run of data collection this weekend. Um, please take a look at the web pages. I would like to see um, <clears throat> what happens when uh, stations in the United States measure WWV as well as BPM. Um, but that's that's what we're working on at the moment. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you. Um, Bill Engel, to uh, AB4EJ. Thanks, Nathaniel. Uh, <clears throat> been very busy the past week or so working on refining the technique and actually getting it working for uploading ring buffer data from the tangerine system to the central host. Uh, there was a flurry of things back and forth on the tangerine mailing list about this. What I'm testing now is using SFTP in conjunction with a heartbeat. So the tangerine will send a heartbeat to the central host at certain interval every minute or two, whatever it is. So the central host knows who's online. Uh, when the super user gives the central host the command, say, I want to get all the data that I, is available from anybody between this start point and that start point, which needs to be within the past 24 hours because it is a 24 hour ring buffer. Uh, the central host will reply to the heartbeat with a data request. Uh, the data request triggers that the tangerine goes out to the ring buffer and identifies all those files as well as all related meta metadata that occurred within those, within those time bookends. Uh, it takes those files and compresses them into a single tar file and then will upload it using SFTP. Um, I'm an anticipating SFTP is under the covers. The actual utility it uses probably will be LFTP because with that you can do things like control the maximum bandwidth of the upload and some other things like that. So uh, the only part of it that I haven't uh, integrated into the code is the, the, uh, the final upload piece where the system takes care of it automatically. Um, uh, yeah, I can do it manually for now. But anyway, so um, the way it, it's planned to work is that each time a file uh, gets, well, each user will have their own dedicated directory and their own dedicated user ID on the central host and uh, their files that they upload will go into their directory. So, and we have very, two or three different ways of validating that it actually came from that person. And then the server will identify when there's been a new file dropped in and then we'll take that file and we can decide what to do with it. Uh, we, those files can be put into a central place. Uh, we know for sure that it will uh, it, it knows what's in the file and it will add information to the relational database so that you can look in the database to find out, you know, tell me all of databases, or rather tell me all the files that have data between this point and that point or, uh, you know, searching various ways, um, you know, looking for particular bands or looking for particular file types and things like that. So anyway, that's coming along and uh, hope to have the upload piece of it working uh, by the end of the week. So back to Ned. Thank you very much, Bill. That sounds very good. All right. Um, how about um, Blair Hearth, KD2 um, EPA? Hello, everybody. Um, 
Blair Hart, Katie to EPA here. I uh, uh, spent the last four days. Dave, I may well have been monitoring the same group that you did uh, if you've been monitoring the Space Studies Board. Um, I've been uh, watching them for the last couple of days. On Wednesday, there was an hour and a half presentation by a Trump administration official on space weather, or in part. And I was impressed at the attention that's being given to the potential uh, destruction that could occur from a CME uh, and the desire on the part of the administration to um, uh, do what's necessary to monitor uh, uh, problems that could uh, affect not only uh, people here on the ground, but also affect uh, travelers in space with the upcoming space missions to the moon and to Mars. Anyway, that's what I've been doing up until about five minutes before I signed into this. Uh, back to you, Nate. Thank you very much, Blair. That sounds great. All right, let's go over to Bill Lyles, NQ6Z. Okay, greetings all. Um, so I've been spending the time uh, converting, trying to convert uh, FallLab to one in Python instead of using MATLAB. So there's a couple of us working on this. And um, it was interesting, I got a question from one person like, are you doing this just for hams or are you gonna actually have researchers use it in Python? I guess mm -hmm. that person didn't think researchers use Python. Um, but the other thing I discovered is Apple's new software release Catalina has improved its security measures and will not allow Python to, to run unless you play some tricks with it. So if anybody upgrades on a Mac to the new operating system and has trouble, let me know and I'll give them the trick. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, that's Welcome. good. Yeah, I have a Catalina here and it does you know, cause certain problems when you're upgrading your system. Um, why don't we go to Josh Vega, WP2JSV next. Hey everyone. Um, so I am the other person working on that far lap to Python uh, conversion. Um, so I'm mainly working on converting the internals of far lap. Uh, so the way far lap's written is it has kind of a back end that's written in Fortran, and then it has a C wrapper around that that provides the MATLAB. API or allows it to interact with MATLAB. And so, um, damn, I just blanked out on his name. Um, the guy who wrote Farlap. Manny? Manny, yeah. Manny Server. Uh, yeah, so Manny, he, uh, he graciously open sourced or made available the code for that MATLAB wrapper. So I've kind of been taking that MATLAB wrapper as a guide to developing a similar wrapper for Python. So um, it'll be num NumPy compatible, um, it'll, it'll be a Python module that you can import just as anything else and it'll be able to interact with Farlap. I've run into some problems and, and this is actually what I've been working on this week is um, Manny builds the thing using or builds the program using um, Intel's Fortran compiler uh, suite, uh, which is uh, proprietary and quite expensive. So I've been scouring the internet for an alternative that would allow me to um, still call the Fortran run uh, Fortran um, functions without actually having the Fortran um, uh, compiler installed. So I I found a deeply hidden on Intel's website the redistributable packages for the Fortran runtime. So I've been trying to work to integrate that into the build pipeline for this package. Um, and so I'm in the middle of that uh, this week. So hopefully, uh, there'll be progress uh, soon and we'll start be able to doing, doing things uh, with this. I mean, it's gonna be a long process. There's a lot of code to convert. Uh, for example, the Ray Trace 2D is about, uh, I think it was 800 lines of C code uh, to convert from MATLAB to C and then back to C, uh, back to MATLAB from C. So, um, and I expect it's gonna be about the same for the Python version. So it's just gonna be a process. Uh, two questions. Wow. Yeah, if you can do that, that'd be amazing. Go ahead. Yeah, for, first question, Python 2 or Python 3? Python 3. Second question, I'm assuming you're looking at the uh, .mod files as what you're trying to link in. 
have you looked at recompiling that in GNU as opposed to sticking solely with uh, Intel? Or do you not have the I source? did. Unfortunately, um, Intel has, um, it, I, I also tried, I tried uh, compiling with uh, G4 Tran or G4, and I also tried writing some basic polyfills for, for kind of, because for one, one example is one of the first problems I ran into with the Intel compiler was there's a, a subroutine called Intel Fast Mem Copy. And so essentially uh -huh. it's just a, a mem copy, but it's an Intel specific one. I'm assuming it's SIMD, whatever. Um, so I tried writing a polyfill for, you know, it's just using standard C uh, mem copy. But then there were other, you know, then there was a different um, uh, subroutine that was, that now needed to be polyfilled. It was just kind of like a tree of them. So I, I, I wasn't able to get it reasonably working that way. So um, but with the redistributable, it looks like it'll work because it'll provide the shared libraries or the shared objects uh, to the, to the uh, environment. So yeah. That all yeah. Works. yeah. At the, the cascading failures associated with starting with Intel or uh, something I've been living with for a while. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I've, I've only just started experiencing them, but uh, not, not enjoying it. Thank you very much for the update, Josh. I'm really impressed you're making progress on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and same to you, Bill, uh, Lyles. Uh, Jerry, why don't you go ahead next? Well, I don't have a whole lot to report. I haven't done anything fun with RF, the ionosphere, or anything like that for the last couple of weeks. But if you want expert opinions on COVID and uh, the uh, virus itself, I can probably talk to you. I've spent a lot of time working on that. And uh, the rest of my time, what I've been doing instead of sleeping has been work-related, trying to figure out what my users and I did to our prey. So, mm. I, I, as I mentioned to uh, Bill in email earlier, I got pulled into essentially an, a cray event horizon, and I, don't, I had to look at the calendar to figure out what day it was and if we were meeting today. So, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I sort of lost track of time. So, that's really about all that's going on here. I did get the USRP1 resurrected and got a little bit of data from the last set of thunderstorms we had come across for lightning, but nothing that I'm really happy with yet. So I'm on the lookout for a somewhat newer uh, receiver with poor bandwidth that I can afford and mm -hmm. uh, then uh, see if I can proceed from there. Did you say, did you say Cray as in the supercomputer I used to know about from decades ago? We have a cute little Cray XC30 at the National Severe Storms Lab that is mine. And <laughs> my, my role is to prevent my scientists from doing odd things. You know, the, the reason I asked about Python is we have had, I, I've actually had some of my science team crash the Cray running Python on the nodes has something to do with not knowing anything about Craig, or about Python garbage collection and filling up memory and uh, with, uh, b by not uh, going ahead and closing your uh, variables and, and uh, deleting them at the end of a loop and then going through, oh, 400,000 loops and all of a sudden your memory requirements exceed the memory on an entire node. <laughs> Remind me to tell you someday about a, uh we got prime computers and there was, a, my friend and I discovered nested uh, directories and we created something called Megadeep. And the prime engineers were not uh, not happy with us. Well, if, if you want to go down that route, I, <laughs> had a, I had a ping sweep go bad once while I was at Johnson Space Center. Walked in on a Monday morning to a call from Carnegie Mellon asking me if I knew anything about a particular IP address that had pretty much taken down Milnet. And the answer was, yeah, I know where that is. I can take care of it right now. All right. Um, thank you very much, Jerry. That sounds good. Um, Aiden, I think you have an, oh, Jerry, you said you need to talk to Bill Engelke, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so. 
Um, you can do that later. Sure. Or no? Okay. Um, all right, Aiden, you have a quick announcement. Oh, um, I almost forgot to mention this. Um, I was applied for and received funding, um, which in this case amounted to about $50 worth, um, but it's nice to not have to pay these things yourself, to go to the Pi Data Conference in Amsterdam. Um, and by Amsterdam, I mean my chair via Zoom. Um, so that conference is entirely online now and is next week, i.e. before the CEDAR workshop. So I will be um, really very sick of sitting in this chair watching things over Zoom. Um, but if I can make it through all that, that should be a lot of fun. Pi Data is the conference from the organization that um, supports the Python lab libraries for data science. So things like pandas, NumPy, um, X-arrays, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning stuff there and I'll let you know what I find. That sounds great, Aiden, thank you. All right, let's go over to um, David, N1HAC. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my big thing is uh, an interesting one. We're hoping to deploy up in Baffin Island. Um, happens to be magnetically conjugate to South Pole where we already have equipment. And uh, I've been asked to put together a version of our large loop antenna. This is 10 feet on a side. Um, and uh, something that we can just send up there and have it deployed rather than have one of us go up there because of, given the current situation, we're not gonna get any chance to either us or another group visit up there. So I'm working on a large loop antenna using, um, my idea is to use tent poles to hold the wire out. We use wire loops and uh, trying to see if I can make something like that work. That sounds great, David. Thank you very much. Um, Magda, uh, go ahead. Hello. Um, just thought I'd finally done with the term and so check in, see what I was doing. I'm working on submitting a paper on the 2017 Eclipse. So. That sounds really good, Magda. Um, so thank you very much for coming for ECE. All right. Um, next, uh, Steve Serwin, uh, go ahead. There, should be on the air now. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, for a semi-retired guy, the semi hadn't been working out too good. I've really been busy working on a, a project plus a series of unfortunate events involving lightning storms and dead freezers and refrigerators and a well going out and getting all that stuff back online and my dogs going out and picking fights with porcupines and losing. Anyway, I haven't had a chance to do much with this size stuff. Last thing I did was uh, learning different ways to separate WWV and WWVH. And before that, it was uh, looking at using timing on the WWD one second fix to uh, learn something about propagation modes. That was a lot of fun. And Christine, I'm glad you're working the satellites. I, I did those in the in the 90s. I worked all states, all satellite. And you'd think that the hard ones would be Alaska and Hawaii from South Texas because those two stations barely fit in the footprint of a Leo bird, but. Actually, I got there fairly early because there's a lot of activity in those two states. The killer was Delaware. I think mm -hmm. back then there were only three hams in Delaware that worked the satellites. I finally looked one of them up, called him on the phone, and made a schedule to get finished. And so my experience with the ham satellites ended on January 1st, 2000, when both of my satellite tracking programs quit working. They were not Y2K compliant. And there weren't, wasn't much to replace them with back at the time. One of them was called InstaTrack, and I forget what the other one was called. But, uh, there's a lot of them out there now. 
I, I moved away from Texas at the time, so I just sort of let that go. And I have a distinction of bringing down a uh, IBM 360, 370 mainframe. And I was taking some uh, graduate courses in computer science. It was, uh, we, we had to write a uh, recursive subroutine to approximate square root. And of course, every time the thing calls itself, it pushes the variables on the stack. And I had a situation with certain numbers, it would hit a bit high or a bit low, or a bit high or a bit low, and never knew it was finished. And of course, it pushed all the variables on the stack every time it called. And in short order, I filled every available byte of memory and brought the whole system down. That was not a popular time. Anyway, that's all I got from here. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, next, uh, how about Mike Cartier, DK5HH from Germany? Yeah, um, yeah, I have a little bit problem to to manage the system. Hopefully, everybody can hear me now. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just for listening here, and uh, my uh, system uh, is, or uh, I can uh, I can give you some information, and I will mail it uh, to the Hamsai uh, about the German system for noise measurement of man-made noise. Uh, we have uh, brought up a system uh, which has now 20 stations and will have up to 50 stations. It's sponsored by the German Amateur Radio Club. And uh, I, I'm, uh, I think I'm one of these people who uh, designed this system. Uh, my uh, part was the system design in total and uh, focus uh, with the software. It is a Repetaya system now, and we have a centralized data center, uh, which uh, made uh, the signal preparation for, uh, uh, for some pictures, for some uh, um, uh, investigation, what the signals mean and how the, uh, man-made noise will develop. I sent you some uh, links for German uh, uh, publications since mostly it is done in German and uh, well, uh, there is no need to do it in English. But uh, the, the uh, IR, uh, IARU uh, region one is now very interested in this system to use it uh, as a um, the man-made monitoring system for the uh, region one. Okay, that's for now. Thank you, Michael. I have a question. Um, has there been any communication between the German group, um, Amateur Radio Club doing this and the American Radio Relay League and their noise project? No. As I know not, uh, we uh, are focused on bringing up the system during the last year. Uh, it's now working from uh, the start of this year. Uh, and well, it is published uh, on the uh, region one, uh, um, on the EM, uh, e, uh, electromagnetic uh, compatibility uh, group. Uh, it is published and maybe some other people from uh, this group uh, has communicated here to the ARRL, uh, but I'm not quite sure. All right, that sounds good. Um, we'll have to get some um, communication between the two groups. I just put the link to your published article in the chat for anyone who wants to see that. There's both, it's both in German and um, in English, or at least the abstracts in English as well. Um, I'm behind a paywall here, so I can't read the whole thing where I'm sitting right now. But um, let me, um, some other people up next may have some comments to say about uh, noise monitoring. Why don't I send it over to Ward Silver and Zero AX next? Okay, thank you uh, for the opportunity to give the information to the group here. Thank you very much for sharing it. 
Okay, I don't really have um, much interesting information here, although um, the YASME Foundation is considering a proposal to add three new RBN stations, reverse beacon network stations, along the north shore of Africa. Um, this is a dark area currently uh, for these receivers, and this would provide some new um, data points um, and in a badly underserved area. And we are looking for more uh, opportunities to install RBN uh, receivers in strategically important locations. So if, if you have a, a spot on the face of the earth, you say, man, I would really like to have some data from there. Um, you might want to give me an email and we can talk about this and see what happens. Um, otherwise, uh, back to Nat. Thank you very much, Ward. That sounds great. Let's go over to uh, Scotty, uh, WA2DFI next. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Nathaniel and everyone in the group. Uh, mostly this week, we've been working on, working with, uh, on the uh, data engine for the uh, Tangerine SDR, we're trying to work out some wrinkles in the FPGA selection, the speed grade. Looks like we're going to be able to get industrial speed grade that will do the job, which actually is kind of a good thing because it, it runs at extended temperature. However, uh, the bad news is the price, and I haven't got the answer back yet or from that. So that's about what's going on here. Back over to you, Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Scotty. Uh, Tom McDermott, uh, N5EG, go ahead. Good afternoon, Nathaniel and everyone. Uh, this week I've spent documenting the cross-loop uh, antenna that I used about five years ago for the um, monostatic uh, ionospheric chirp sounder. And in that process, I received a large number of requests, both on the mail list and privately, for features that folks would like to see in the cross-loop antenna. Unfortunately, a large number of those features are mutually exclusive. And so I documented up uh, the S-built configuration, uh, an experimental preamp I'm using, which is badly overloaded, and then discussed um, some of the requirements and and a proposed block diagram for perhaps something where we can use pluggable modules to build an amplifier that might uh, via different plugins satisfy some of the different unique requirements that folks have surfaced. Ultimately, I think we're gonna need to put together a requirements list of what we need for the uh, personal space weather station and see if we can come up with a couple of alternatives that might uh, do that. And uh, I really appreciate David McGraw giving me information and a couple of preamp schematics. Uh, hopefully the document will spur discussion to where the team can, can kind of converge on a couple of key requirements and we may be able to figure out a scheme for putting stuff that, that together. So that's kind of what the document's about. I published that probably two, three hours ago to the mail list. So uh, back to you, Nathaniel. You're welcome. Thank you, McGraw. It's McGraw, not McGraw. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, yes, I saw that, and then uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about some of that today. Um, okay, so next, um, let's go to Rob Robinette. And Rob has also been doing quite a bit of work looking at noise. Are you there, Rob? Okay, uh, maybe we will come back to Rob in a little bit. Um, how about um, John, any OBJ? Hey, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, got quite a few irons in the fire here uh, this week. I was pushing pretty hard with uh, working in conjunction with Bill Anglicky on the uh, file structure document and the node naming document. And we're sort of fleshing that out and 
right now I am coding it for the low cost personal weather station to make sure it really makes sense. And then I'm going to push it out and have that done. But uh, Bill's been a significant help and I can't thank him enough for his comments. Uh, I'm also working on getting two more grape, which are the low cost personal space weather stations out to two other clients. Uh, I'm also rewriting the FLDG 4.1.12 analysis code to handle the new data structure for doing the node naming and all that kind of stuff. Uh, also in conjunction with that, I ran a six day, actually yeah, today's the sixth day at U zero zero UTC tonight. We'll finish the six day test of the FL Digi uh, input frequency stability tracking thing for Nathaniel and for Phil. And then I'll finish it for FL Digi, and then I start another six-day trial with using Spectrum Lab, which I'm going to be installing and hopefully getting that running soon. Um, just as a comment, I had upgraded from the Mac Mojave to the Mac new Mac OS, and it killed all of my CAD packages. So I went back to Mojave and stay away from it because the CAD packages cost more than a computer. Um, and as a retrospect, back in when I was in college in 1981, I had bought a PDP 1120 with 16K core memory, and it came with paper tape basic, which would had one unique feature that it would allow recursion. And I can actually calculate 1000 factorial using basic, which as you know, if you ever play with a calculator, when you could be out in 69 factorial, the exponent goes up over 100 and you can't do it anymore. So we did 1,000 factorial. It gave this page long number. It was pretty impressive. And in comments to Christina, I have to get my azimuth elevation rotor stationary again as well. I haven't had it up in, since the satellites. I was activated with it in the 90s like, uh, whoops. My system key up. Can you still hear me? Here we go. Mm -hmm. Zoom keeps cutting out on me here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's new satellites up there, but I stopped back in the late 90s because it seems like all the satellites are dying. But anyway, other than that, I'm not doing much. And back to Matt. All right. Thank you very much, John. Um, how about uh, David Kasdan? Uh, go ahead. Greetings all. Um, yeah, listening to all this, I realized Hamsai has been planning one way or another for every eclipse for getting on three years now. Maybe time to do the experiment and not plan for one, make sure it happens anyway without us. Um, I too have been doing noise stuff. Uh, I've got my own project going here, which we've talked about some, the Coherent CW project. For those who don't know about it very briefly, it was a 1970s signal processing attempt at synchronization of of CW transmission and reception over very narrow bandwidth to improve signal to noise ratio for CW transmission. It was promising in the 70s when the only digital medium, the only digital mode the FCC permitted was radio teletype. When the FCC opened the floodgates for digital modes, coherent CW went away. But we realized a couple of months ago it has the charm of being the only digital mode permitted on HF by technicians. And the regulations don't say that you actually have to know any Morse in order to be able to use it. So the mode lends itself well to being used as a sort of telegraph teletype code, but it's Morse. It's, it, it hits the sweet spot of human readability and machine readability. So I've been working on some Python code for that, see if we can package a modern version using a Raspberry Pi. The additive noise uh, about matches theory. The, uh, the, the Morse is detectable with high reliability, meaning greater than 90% of uh, less than 10% bit error rates for additive white noise not worse than about 12 decibels below, uh, 12 decibels above the signal. You can dig out a Morse signal with this pretty well. A really good high ear CW operator can get a couple decibels below noise. This promises to get about 10 decibels below that. Um, uh, maybe next meeting, I'll show some of the simulations that I've been preparing. Our, the case folks have seen them. An interesting next problem is getting high audio 
to work with this. It has quite a latency and this requires 100 millisecond epics that are within say 5% of timing by, by GPSTO to keep everybody synchronized. The latency of high audio that I've come across won't permit that. So I've got to figure out another strategy and maybe folks here can help. But anyway, that's what I've been working on. Uh, David, Thank quick you question. Uh, uh, what is the word per minute rate on the uh, <coughs> coherent CW typically? The system got standardized around 12 words per minute because by the International Telecommunications Union definition of Morse code, 12 words per minute has 100 millisecond elements exactly. You can run it at whatever speed you wish, but that's what the system got standardized around. Okay, Bill, where are you? Got a very impressive set of displays oh, behind you. <laughs> that is the, um, that's part of NASA mission control. It's a background. Oh. Uh, put that in just to get your goat. Just <laughs> You got me good. You're wondering that very question. So it works. Back to net. All right, thanks everybody. Let's see, I still haven't heard from Mike Neruda, AAHK. I'm unmuted. Um, I've been uh, preoccupied this week. Uh, my wife just got out of the uh, hospital with, uh, she went in for uh, breathing and cardiac issues. So uh, I'm still catching up on the, uh, the list. Oh, I did uh, add my uh, Gmail address to the mail list, and I'm receiving that quite uh, regularly. Uh, I believe the Comcast uh, email was the one that was bouncing and uh, getting discontinued. Um, since we're comparing beard lengths, I don't know if that's visible, but how about this? Yeah, AAK and a punch card. Nice. Yeah, I, I punched many, many thousands of those in my career. <laughs> Don't drop your deck. Yeah, I, I used to program when 8K bytes, and we had the double size. It came in 4K bytes, so that was a little tight, but we, when we got 8K, we thought, why would we ever need more? That's amazing. Well, I hope your wife is doing better. So, all right, I think, is there anyone I missed? Rob, are you back? Rob Robinette. <laughs> no, well, I guess we'll open it for general discussion. Is anybody on Fusion, the Yezu digital mode? I, I mm -hmm. have thought we'll, we'll do it, but it, it really hasn't attracted my interest enough to, to edge out the other thousand things I'm doing. So theoretically, yes, but in practice, no. It, it's pretty much a P25 like system, uh, closer to P25 than most people realize. It's gotten popular in this neck of the woods, so I've, I've got a walkie-talkie with it, and I was uh, going to go fly about an hour ago, but this conference came up, and I think I'm still going to go this afternoon. And so I take my little talkie with me flying, and let me tell you, when you get your antenna at 6,000 feet, you can talk to people. Where do you fly it? It's a Cessna 175. Okay. Nice plane. Yeah, so I'm going to take it up and, of course, Fusion ducks into the VOIP and comes out anywhere that you want. But I, I work both that mode as well as just regular FM. I had to you make it. Dave, uh, Witten, uh, mute. We're getting feed through. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I made a decision, uh, fusion or DMR and went to uh, DMR. So I've learned how to program a code plug and I've got a hot spot and now I just have to figure out if there's anybody worth talking to. I've had a DR1X and a DR2X repeater. And uh, the only, the advantage I see in fusion is you can run both analog and digital with the same equipment, same frequency. Um, the range is uh, quite interesting. When, when the analog was falling off, uh, they switched to digital and it's better than the analog copy. We have a remote node uh, that links us into the uh, uh, Detroit Metro room, which covers this part of the state. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of nice. Play with it. Okay, uh, Jerry, uh, Chris, I think you said you wanted to talk to me about something. Yeah, uh, I, what I wanted to do is suggest you take a look at uh, you know, th this LDM system, which is a published subscribe type system. And, you know, for, for data transfer, you drop a file in place and LDM looks out there, says, oh, that file needs to be sent and is dropped out and is made available to other LDM systems that are requesting whatever feed uh, you, you might have. So you could have a feed type of experimental setup and uh, have all those files go into experimental and you're, you could have either a pattern match for the feed or just take everything that comes in. And that if you set it up properly, any and all of the stations could, with fairly low overhead, actually serve as a relay or uh, feed out their data to a variety of master, uh, master servers. Uh, it's fairly low overhead. You know, with, you know we, we use this. It's not an untested system. We've been using it for over 20 years for weather data. And it's anything from large files, like weather model data, are transmitted this way, satellite imagery is transmitted this way, radar data is transmitted as 100 radial uh, packets uh, that can then be reassembled into a full radar scan. So it's, it, it's a thought. Um, I find using something like L uh, LFTP or uh, SCP has a lot more programming overhead that you got to use when you're trying to do data transfer like this. The other thing is there are starting to be some applications out there uh, in the uh, open geospatial consortium realm for moving sensor data, which is essentially what we're talking about. And uh, finding some of these applications, which are again, either a uh, direct stream or pub sub or uh, something along those lines might be an interesting way to do this if we can get one that's uh, low enough uh, overhead to not interfere with what's going on on a relatively small server. Well, I will certainly investigate that and read up on it and see if there's a, you know, if, if there's a good use case for it in this case. I, I don't know enough about it to, to, to make a judgment at this point, but I will definitely follow up on it. Yeah, in, in the weather learn detail, about it. if you if you want to play with LDM, talk to me, because I use it for, it, it is my hammer in search of a nail in a lot of cases. I even use it for triggering workflows when data comes in. So it's, you know, there, there are a lot of ways you can use it and abuse it and make it do things. Is this something you install on a server or are there public servers that handle this or? I've got it on a Raspberry Pi sitting right over there. I've got it on a server sitting here. I've got it on my desktop. Uh, around my lab at the National Weather Center, we probably don't have more than 50 or 60 LDM servers scattered around doing various independent things. It's for, for us, in, our, in my world, it's a utility. It's like, oh, I've got to do something with LDM. Why do you have to do it with LDM? 
because it's so easy to set up and, and make it do what I want. And I suppose it's open source freeware. Absolutely, positively on time. It's an NSF uh, funded project. It's it's been around about thirty years. Um, if I can't answer the question on how to set something up for you, a I know the people who wrote the original code, and b I'll have to go learn it because uh, the guy who's currently maintaining it has probably snuck something in that I've just missed, but I've been using the stuff forever. I okay. just put a link to the UCAR uh, Unidata page on LDM in the chat. Yeah, that'll work. And if, if you uh, just did a Unidata LDM Google search, you'd come up with the same page. It, it It's a fairly cool system. In fact, uh, I'm about to set that exact thing up on my weather station to uh, get data in from outside via wireless, uh, a uh, Wi-Fi uh, system. So my data will come completely uh, solar powered, go through the Pi, get punched into the uh, Wi-Fi system in the house and go to one of the servers here to be collected and then shipped out. Yeah, it looks like it's yeah, it's developed by um UCAR, University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Yeah, Unidata is a division of uh UCAR that was designed uh from the ground up under an NSF grant to support data distribution and management to uh universities and uh colleges. They've branched out a little bit. Uh LDM is used by NOAA to move data around. I used it on an oceans project. Uh, it, 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 it's just a general utility. And it's not completely bulletproof. It's absolutely possible to configure the thing in a way that you can screw things up mightily, but you really have to work at it to get there. I can do that. And, and if you're not already, you will become a Perl regular expression expert. <laughs> regular expressions. Uh, not exact. That's right up there with eating canned peas and cooked spinach. But anyway, learn it like anything else, I guess. Never trust a major software project to an oceanographer with two actual Fortran classes. That's what happens is you get Perl regular expressions and you uh, don't worry about the uh, sin act handshake and PCP. Okay, back to net. All right, thank you very much. So you have a couple minutes left. Um, maybe Tom, do you wanna to talk about your uh, antenna paper at all? Okay, let me hit the space bar here. I was looking up uh, Christina's XKCD cartoon there. Um, the, uh, hopefully, uh, the intention for the paper was to try to start a discussion to where we, we can uh, see if we can come up with some solutions that, that would work there. I'd encourage folks to read it in maybe next week or next uh, HamSci Telecom or via the, um, uh, via the, a mail list we can uh, we can discuss what's needed and perhaps a way uh, perhaps a way of doing it I think it the, the intention here is to make something that's low cost but somewhat flexible so we can get perhaps a couple different applications out of it um, I modeled it after the pluggable filter option that we put on tangerine SDR and I'm hoping maybe we can share some pieces between the two that would be really good Certainly our initial like use cases include WWV, CHU reception for Doppler shift, monitoring these um, chirp ionosons, and also being able to um, monitor FT8, um, our, act as an RBN skimmer and whisper. Okay, that's good. What that does is um, basically 
um, sets a, a set of requirements where we might be able to filter out the entire AM broadcast band and lower, uh, which, mm -hmm. which uh, you know, eases a lot of uh, problems. And so that may be one application set. And, you know, if the filter, for example, is pluggable, we could put a high pass filter in there for one set of applications and change it to a low pass filter for a different set of applications. And so all of those would be good and that various folks could use the same design and then just swap out the filter module that they might need for their particular application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that. And I like this idea of basically having, you know, designing one module or one side of the system, you know, really geared toward HF because it seems like that's doable. And then for people who want the lower frequencies, you know, I think um, hopefully eventually we will create a VLF module, um, you know, and maybe a different antenna design um, for those lower frequencies too. And since the Tangerine SDR has the two different um, two module slots, you'd be able to support both with the same data engine. Um, but I think that would um, make the design um, much more doable. Yeah, that, um, that's good. If we can um, try to converge on, you know, step one is to do an HF optimized antenna, step two is to do something else. If we can put together a list like that, then we can try and model mm -hmm. and come up with a couple of things that would, I think, accelerate progress. Yeah, I think that uh, sounds good. Or Nathaniel, just curious, is that uh, loop, is that antenna applicable for general HF work? Would I want to stick one on my roof for working 20 meters? It, it, it's, a receive, it's a receive only loop. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. As a receive, I have, you know, if I want a separate receive antenna, would that be usable, doable? It would certainly mm -hmm. have benefits in, uh, in noise reduction. Yeah, um, I have some comments on that. Uh, I kind of question the bandwidth of this antenna because it's um, looking at the preamplifier, it's going in as a voltage, not current. And um, that's going to have much higher response at high frequencies than lower frequencies. Yeah, this particular preamp was designed to work um, uh, on 80 meters and, uh, and up, and it seems to work fairly well going up. It works very poorly going down, and that's why I don't recommend this particular preamp designed for general ham uses. It was intended to be high dynamic range and prevent overload from a co-located 80 meter transmit antenna. Yeah. So neither of those designs is very good for general ham use. And I would not recommend either of the amps that are in there. Yeah, what, um, you know, the amplifiers we use, as I've mentioned before, load it um, with a low resistance in the 30 to 50 ohms range. And as such, working against the inductance of the loop, it, uh, evens out the frequency response. Whereas this is going in um, as a voltage, which has a very, you know, it's a, uh, was it 3 dB per octave or 6 dB per octave? I forget which um, rising characteristic. I guess it's 6 dB, um, normal LR, um, L type of response. Um, the other thing I notice on the preamp is that there's, it's going in differential and any static electricity that would be induced in it would go in as a common mode voltage. Um, one change I would make to it is to ground it at the center point, but that's not set up to be able to do that easily. But yeah, you know, we should try a number of different uh, designs and um, see what seems most suitable for us. Yeah, the, the, I was trying to, to converge towards the block diagram uh, at, the, at the back end of the document there and get some comments on that. 
Um, it, in, in the case, if I don't know if this is practical or not, one of the drawbacks of this particular block that uh, Nathaniel's got up on the screen is uh, you can't really run feedback from the output of the second gain stage up to the first gain stage because the filter phase response will give you a good oscillator there. But if you can, if you can independently set the gains of the two stages, uh, you may be able to have a low enough gain in the first stage that it doesn't overload, but a high enough gain, it doesn't degrade the noise figure. And then in the filter slot there, you've got a fairly well impedance matched filter slot. And you can perhaps put an AM broadcast uh, band reject filter or a high pass or a low pass. I was hoping we might get to a state, a point where um, we could design something where with different filters in that slot, we might be able to, you know, provide a couple different applications. I don't know, I don't know how practical that is. I've not modeled any of this. Yep. Um, another suggestion, I haven't had a chance to go and look, but um, the UMass Lowell um, digits, Digisons use a loop antenna for their receive, and that would be have been designed to be broadband and probably flat response. Um, we might take a look at their design. Okay. Is, do they have anything public, publicly available on their designs? I've seen them. I can't remember if I just read the manual or uh, if it's online. Okay, very good. I'll go take a look at that. That's a good note to, uh, to go chase down. Yeah, the particular uh, amp here was, was quite successful. The amp A was successful on the, on the experiment. So I figured I would at least document what I did because it, it worked for that one application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if anyone's been around uh, Digison, there's one that wallops I know and I've, there have been a number of others I've I've seen UMass Lowell's spaced them out all over the place. Uh, I don't know which ones are still working, um, but uh, it looks like a pyramid of uh, pipe sitting in the field. They do have a magnetic loop that they've got a drawing of, but uh, I don't see anything on the website specific to uh, dimensions or like, or any of the preamp or electronics are matching. And the uh, pyramidal antenna you're talking about, I, I, I think Tom's antenna sort of got it beat on compactness. Yeah. Uh, so the question we have, I think, is for the personal space weather station is trying to come up with you know, it, it's kind of a hybrid. Uh, can you build it in your own workshop? Uh, is it inexpensive? And what problem does it solve? And if we can get answers to those three questions, it, it, you know, we might be able to put out design A for those folks. And then, uh, and then if we want to have low frequency response, we can come out with a design B that's better optimized for low frequencies. And uh, mm -hmm. that, way, that way people at least can get started. I agree. Well, it's four o'clock now, so I think we're going to draw this meeting to a close for the day. Um, but I think this is good discussion, and hopefully we can continue this antenna discussion um, on the list and, um, and probably also maybe on the tangerine zooms as well. So we'll keep talking about the antennas. Um, let's see. So I think our next telecon is tentatively scheduled for two weeks from now. Um, but that's also, that would be June 25th. I may um, either cancel or postpone it a week because that week, June 25th, is um, the week of June 25th. That's the CEDAR meeting. Um, I have to look at what this schedule is going to be. I know Aiden sent out um, to the list um, some information about the CEDAR workshop. Um, and so it just may not be a good idea to conflict with that. So I will send everyone an email on the list about what we're going to do. 
Um, as we get a little closer, CEDAR is still figuring themselves out as well. And once we get all of that in line, um, we will know what we're doing. Is all right. Week, um, weekend of field day? Uh, it's the week before field day. Before so CEDAR is, yeah, it's uh, Monday, June 22nd through either Thursday or Friday. So it's right before field day. Field day. 26, 27. Yeah, field day is 27th to 28th. Okay. 27th, yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. So you can participate in the CR workshop and field day. If you're still alive. If you're still alive, yes. <laughs> That's, if we make it through. This has always been the challenge for me with field day recently because they have these workshops that are coming out in like Santa Fe or Colorado. And one year, I had back-to-back -back workshops in Colorado, and field day was right in between. So um, I actually got to visit a field day site out in Colorado in between the conferences. But, yeah. All right. Um, anything else? I have one question. Can I get Tom's nice paper? It's, it uh, should be on yeah, it was sent out to the Hamsai and the Tangerine mail lists this morning. Okay, I'll look for that. Thank you. Question for Nathaniel. The yeah. data that I've created for the FL Digi uh, frequency extraction, is there a place that you want me to pay, place the final raw data or especially when I get the um, lab stuff done as well? Or should do we you do want to record this? Archive it to Zenodo in the Hamsai community on Zenodo. Uh, I work with Christina on that. I'm not sure how to do that. So, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, if you get it to okay. me, I can, I can take care of that part because then Aiden and I will be able to uh, to cite it in our paper. Yeah, plus you're going to be wanting it anyway, so you're going to need to have access to it as well. Dave is sure probably, am, yeah. probably want to play with the filter constant since he's got data now to play with. So, okay. Sounds great. Okay. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. And I'll see some of you a little later this evening. Um, I hope you have a great day. 73. Congrats on the new house. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.